Last time we were together, we were just leaving off the end of this Hyksos period. The Hyksos, as you know, were foreigners, and thus the native Egyptians didn't like them. Generally, people don't like to be ruled by foreigners, but the Hyksos had been able to insinuate themselves into the life of Egypt such that, at least for a time, you have this Semitic ruler in, or rulers in uh, Egypt, but we were mentioning last time we were together, in the south of Egypt, there was a new movement afoot to try to drive them out. This was the 17th dynasty. It was during a period it was intermediate. There was decentralized authority. But the 17th dynasty finally launched its attack and was able to defeat them and drive the Hyksos out and reestablish a kingdom. So you recall that in Egyptian history you've got kingdom periods and intermediate periods. Kingdom periods are centralized authority, one ruler over the whole land. Intermediate periods are decentralized, where you've got two or more rulers. So we have a new kingdom, and that's what it's called, the new kingdom now, which lasts for about 500 years, and it comes at the tail end of the Hyksos era because the Hyksos have been driven out. The first dynasty of this new kingdom era is called the 18th dynasty. It's one of the most interesting dynasties of all of Egyptian history. Some of the most famous names of pharaohs come from this. Tutankhamun was an 18th dynasty pharaoh. Akhenaten was an 18th dynasty pharaoh. Hatshepsut was an 18th dynasty pharaoh and others as well. So this is a time that really is fascinating and usually if people know anything about Egyptian history, they'll know something about the 18th dynasty. What's interesting is that if we do a straight chronological overlay of the Exodus story based on the, the facial biblical chronology, the Exodus would take place during the 18th dynasty. That's based on a statement that's made over in, uh, in uh, Second King, or First Kings, I think it is, that says that the building of the temple by Solomon was precisely 480 years after the Exodus. And so that, and we know pretty closely the reign of Solomon, and so just by doing some simple arithmetic, we can go backwards and we find out that if that's correct, and, and it's a pretty straightforward statement, then that would put the Exodus right in the middle of the 18th dynasty. Now what I'm doing here is taking, I think, the most commonly accepted chronology of 18th dynasty events. This is not driven by any biblical agenda. This is what you'd get from, I think, the best Egyptologists out there these days. These would be the accepted dates for events in the 18th dynasty and just laying on top of it the chronology of the Exodus and see if anything matches up, you see. His, uh, Egypt does not give us any reference to the Exodus. We don't have any hieroglyph that shows the waters parting and the children of Israel running across the Red Sea. We don't have that. It's, we're not surprised at that. Typically, the ancients didn't report their great defeats, you know. Usually, it was propaganda. And in propagandistic terms, you tend to minimize bad news and maximize good news. And so we're not surprised that the Exodus is not mentioned. But the question is, do we find any plausible sort of correlation between the Exodus account on the one hand and what's commonly accepted Egyptian history on the other? So I want to give you, right up front, full disclaimer, this is hypothesis. I'm not teaching this as Bible truth. I'm simply saying that when you take these two accounts, accepted Egyptian history and facial biblical chronology and lay them on top of each other, this is the story you get. I'm not going to keep apologizing. I just want to say up front, please understand, we're kind of in a hypothetical world here, but let's see if the story makes sense. All right, so that's what's, uh, that's what's going on. The first king of the 18th dynasty was a guy by the name of Amos. He rules for some 25 years, 1570 to 1546. He left a lot of nice snapshots. This is one of them. 
He uh, is, first of all, credited, probably most famously, with finishing up the project of driving out the Hyksos. The king, who was the last king of the 17th dynasty, was named Kamos. He was killed, apparently, in the battles with the Hyksos. We found his mummy. It really shows some pretty dramatic evidence of brutal uh, loss of life. I mean, big gaping holes in the skull, that kind of thing. I show the pictures to my junior high students. They love to see it. I thought I'd spare you, you know. But uh, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, the, uh, the dynasty ends then with Kamos, and so the guy that sort of does the mop-up at the end of it is Amos. And he's a new family, but he's credited with driving out the Hyksos. He establishes Egypt's first standing army. Up until this time, armies were mustered ad hoc. But Amos was so concerned about the Hyksos threat that he decides to create a professional standing army to guard the borders of Egypt. And this is the first time in Egyptian history we have a paid professional army that's, you know, 24-7 out there guarding the borders. Another interesting aspect of the 18th dynasty in this pharaoh is he's the first guy to use the high-tech weaponry of the day known as the chariot. Egypt had never used chariots to our knowledge up until this moment, but he's the one that incorporates them. We're interested in that because, of course, the Exodus story itself prominently mentions chariots. And if we knew that Egypt didn't have chariots by then, it would be an, ac an anachronism we'd have to deal with. But at this point, we know there were chariots, and they were the kind that uh, would have fit the description that we find in the biblical account. It's very likely that this pharaoh, Amos, is the pharaoh who is referred to in Exodus chapter 1 as the pharaoh who did not know Joseph. That's not to say that he never heard of Joseph or that he had no acquaintance with the history even of Joseph. He probably knew all of that. Joseph was presumably a fairly well-known figure. But it had been a hundred years since the great events in which Joseph was a central player. Joseph died at 130 years old. He was 30 years old when he became vizier in Egypt. And so, you know, some time has passed. But more importantly, Joseph represented that Hebrew population that was associated with the Hyksos. And so even though the Hebrews were not driven out, this is why this Pharaoh would have all of a sudden had a very new and negative attitude toward these Hebrews because they were associated with the Hyksos who themselves were despised and hated. And so it accounts at least to some degree for the concern that this Pharaoh would have that if the Hyksos reinvaded, these Hebrews might become a fifth column within Egypt to join the enemies. And in fact, that very concern is expressed in Exodus as part of the rationale for why this particular Pharaoh became so brutal in his treatment of the Hebrews. So that's basically the story of Amos. The next guy uh, is named Amenhotep I. He reigns for about 25 years. Good looking guy. Didn't leave a whole lot of records of his reign. And from our point of view, it's not all that important to do too much detail on him. He seems to have carried out the policies of his father Amos. And that would certainly include negative policies that would have been applied to the Hebrews. The next character, however, is of some interest to us. This is Tutmos I, and he reigns not for that long, about eight years. He takes the uh, throne in 1524. He is not of the family line. He married into the family because uh, uh, Amenhotep I died without a male heir, and it was reckoned in Egyptian thought that the, the real line came through the female anyway, and so somebody from outside could marry a royal wife and sort of become, by a bootstrap effect, a legitimate pharaoh. And that's the way that Tutmos got into the line here. So it's, a, it's the same dynasty, but he marries the royal daughter of Amenhotep I and becomes then uh, the next pharaoh. He doesn't reign for that long, but we are interested in him, first of all, because he was a great military character, and all of these Tutmos guys were. Uh, Tutmos I, of course, was military, and he was very concerned about beefing up the defenses and making strong the army and so on, and he did engage in some military campaigns that were fairly successful. 
We're also interested in him, however, because though he had no sons, by his royal wife he had one daughter, and her name was Hatshepsut. And Hatshepsut, if the chronology lines up correctly, would be the daughter of Pharaoh that recovered Moses from the uh, river. We know that the Exodus would have taken place 400 and year, 480 years prior to the building of the temple. That would be about the year 1447 to 1445, somewhere in that time frame. We know that Moses was 80 years old at the time of the Exodus, so you add 80 more years, and that puts his birth right about at the beginning of the reign of Tutmos, or possibly at the tail end of the reign of Amenhotep. So again, in terms of just lining up the chronologies, this would be about the time of the birth of Moses, and Hatshepsut would be the most obvious candidate as a daughter of Pharaoh who would have recovered Moses from the river. And so we're going to assume that for the time being because that seems to be the most plausible explanation of things. The family gets a little bit complicated here, so I want to try to give you some idea just what's going on. We have Tutmos. He has no sons by his royal wife. To the Egyptians, it was very important that the successor to the throne be connected to the royal wife. The problem is, in the case of Tutmos, the only living descendant he had was Hatshepsut. He had two sons by her, they both died. And so we have one daughter, and of course the Egyptians were a little nervous about having a female pharaoh. And Tutmos I was concerned about that. He did, however, he had, however, another son by a minor wife, or possibly a concubine, and that was the son that came to be called Tutmos II. But the problem is, sons that were born by minor wives didn't have as clear a claim to the throne. And so, Tutmos I arranged a happy relationship here between Hatshepsut on the one hand and Tutmos II on the other, her half-brother. Now, we, of course, are a little offended that uh, the ancient Egyptians would do this, but actually it was worse than this. Sometimes you would have full brother and sister marriages back in those days, and that was, that was practiced in Egypt, not uncommonly. Uh, most other ancient civilizations didn't uh, engage in that. But uh, in any event, this was pretty much an accepted practice. And of course, through Hatshepsut, that gave Tutmos II a clear-cut legitimacy in terms of his claim to be the succeeding pharaoh. And so he takes over, and he's married to his half-sister Hatshepsut, and they reign for, uh, together for 14 years. He was never in very good health. He did not have any sons. He had one daughter by Hatshepsut, and we don't know anything about her. But he also had a son by a harem girl, and that guy came to be called Tutmos III. Tutmos II died at a fairly early age. He was never in good health, and that would be, make Tutmos III the successor to the throne. But again, you have a legitimacy problem because he's born of a fairly minor wife, and he's only a kid. You know, he was about eight years old when his father, Tutmos II, died. Hatshepsut, bless her heart, steps up and say, hey, I'll mind the shop until Tutmos III is old enough to take over. Thank you, Hatshepsut. She's just a wonderful, giving person, you know. And so that's what happens. So just to summarize that little complicated piece of the puzzle, we have Tutmos I, 1524 to 1518. Then you've got Tutmos II and wife Hatshepsut, 1518 to 1504. Then you've got Tutmos III and Hatshepsut as regent, 1504 to 1498, and then, voila, you have Hatshepsut. <laughs> She's shrewd. People have likened her to Queen Elizabeth I or somebody like that. She is astute on steroids, you know. She's just... And so she always probably had her eye on the, on the throne. And so when she offers to be regent... While well, Tutmos is a little boy, she probably already had designs to shuffle him off somewhere else, and that's what she did. Probably the biggest single blunder that she made in her career was that she shuffled Tutmos III off as a boy 
off to the military. Not a smart move. She was not well liked by the military because she was kind of a pacifist. She didn't like warfare. She never went to war. She wanted to engage in peaceful relationships with her neighbors. And so she was actually kind of diminishing the status of the military. And I think she thought she could diminish the status of Tutmos III at the same time. But of course, the military was somewhat resentful of that particular strategy. She preferred trading to raiding. And that was really something she was pretty good at, and Egypt did well, and was really quite uh, successful and prosperous under her reign. She always had a problem convincing the Egyptian people that she was really for real a pharaoh. She'd wear the fake beard. I mean, everyone knew she was female. She wasn't trying to fool anyone in that sense, but she wore the false beard and otherwise carried herself off as a genuine pharaoh. But of course, the ancient Egyptians were never quite so sure, you know, that that was exactly a legitimate claim. And one of the things she did to try to persuade them was she built a, a, a really remarkable mortuary temple. And I'm guessing somebody in this room has been there. Has anybody ever, have you been there? What was it like? Did you get to walk through it, Carolyn? Was it, was it impressive? Yeah, it's uh, commonly understood as just a great propaganda piece. And so as you go through it, you find all kinds of artwork, all kinds of you know, hieroglyphs and other sorts of things that are intended to communicate to the Egyptian people, this pharaoh is a true and legitimate ruler of Egypt. And part of the message that's communicated there was that the gods you know, were presiding at her birth and they were there giving, you know, kind of orchestrating this whole thing that she would become the next pharaoh. How much the Egyptian people were persuaded by that remains an open question, but in any event, that's what she was trying to do. About the time that she becomes the exclusive pharaoh, Moses would be about 30 years of age. It has been hypothesized by some that Hatshepsut, who had no male heirs, may have been grooming her adopted son, Moses, to be her successor. That would be at least plausible. We don't have any record that that was in fact the case, but we wouldn't expect to have any such record, but it certainly would make sense. So it could be that Moses was actually someone who at least by this time in history envisioned that he could be the next Pharaoh. If that's the case, Moses, who certainly knew his Hebrew background, may have seen this as a wonderful opportunity that God himself had ordained by which he, with the authority of Pharaoh, could lift the burdens on his people. He seems to have had designs to somehow help them in their unhappy circumstances some way or other. And it may very well be that Moses was anticipating being able to play that role and perform that service at that time. But in any event, we can assume he was a major player in the administration of Hatshepsut and probably had some considerable responsibilities. Josephus certainly gives us some hint that that would be the case and that would be the traditional Jewish understanding of it. Unfortunately for Hatshepsut, however, Tutmos III kept growing. And as time went on, of course, this little boy became a man, and he became a man who was a central rallying point for the military of Egypt. He was extremely popular. He was a person who had evident military prowess and indeed genius, and that was recognized. And so over time, the military continued to give him increasing loyalty and support, and I suppose encouragement, that he should take what was rightfully his, which is the throne. So in about the mid-1480s, we have a somewhat obscure set of circumstances. It's not clear exactly what happened. All we know is that Hatshepsut died somewhat unexpectedly. Was she poisoned? Was there a palace coup? Not clear. Was it violent? Was it subterfuge? You don't know. But she wasn't old enough to just die of natural causes, but somehow she disappears from the scene in the mid-1480s. Well, that puts Moses, if this is all correct, in a bit of a pickle, you see. Because he, of course, is fully associated with Hatshepsut, and insofar as she is viewed as the enemy by Tutmos III, he is viewed as the enemy as well. And this may very well be the reason that Moses, when he was pushing 40, 
decided to go out and actually make contact with his Jewish, you know, neighbors, friends, uh, uh, family, and so on. Uh, and at least the, uh, the account from Exodus indicates that that's what he did. He went out to see how they were doing and obviously went out not just for a friendly biz- visit, you know, not just having a cup of coffee. He was going out there with designs to play a role for them. In the New Testament, we hear he had thought that God was going to use him to liberate the people. And it may be that he thought, okay, this is my chance. I'm going to spend my political capital right now, right here, before this storm really breaks loose. I'm going to go out and do what I can to liberate these people. Well, you know the story. He gets caught in a labor dispute and winds up using some of his martial arts that I'm sure he learned in the palace there on one of the Egyptian taskmasters, and he's got a dead body on his hands, and uh, that presents a problem. With the political winds changing, you can imagine that Tutmose III, who already would like to get rid of Moses, now has every reason to do so. The guy now can be accused legitimately of murder. Moses seems to feel that he's blown his big chance and he has to flee. And so about this time, Moses fled. The route that that, that is indicated, he went to Midian, and so the likely route would be across the northern part of the Sinai Peninsula. This was a well-known, well-used trade route, and it would get him safe from Egypt outside the jurisdiction, outside really the influence of Egypt to a place called Midian. Midian is part of present-day Saudi Arabia. It's part of the Arabian Peninsula. It's a well-known region. There's no controversy about where it is in terms of a modern map, and that would be about the location right there. So that would be the route that Moses probably took, and by so doing, he gets free, and he settles in. You know the story of Moses. He finds there a family, a kind of a clan. He attaches himself to a fellow named Ruel. He marries one of their daughters. One of his daughters, Zipporah, has a couple of kids. And probably from the point of view of Moses, he thought, had my big chance, blew it, it's over, I'm going to be tending sheep for the rest of my life, and indeed he is there for a good long time. Meantime, back at the ranch, Tutmose III has now successfully acquired the throne. So while Moses is off tending sheep, Tutmose is distinguishing himself as undoubtedly one of the greatest military geniuses of Egyptian history. His first order of business is to rewrite Egyptian history as best he can and get rid of any favorable references to Hatshepsut. This was his stepmother. This was someone he hated, and he wanted to basically just eliminate her from the annals. He didn't succeed. We know a whole lot about Hatshepsut, but nevertheless, he does the best he can to try to get rid of memories of her. He then launches a series of very, very successful military campaigns in a variety of directions. He extends the borders of Egypt southward into Nubia, or what we would call Ethiopia, but more interestingly, he also pushes in a major campaign up into Canaan. And so Tutmos is the guy who's actually able to extend, by a kind of hegemony, the control of Egypt into Canaan all the way up so that it touches the other major empire of the day, which was the Hittite Empire. Now, you know the Hittites are mentioned passingly in the Old Testament. We never hear a whole lot of description of them. We don't hear about them the way we hear of the Assyrians or the Babylonians, but nevertheless, they are mentioned. Who's the most famous Hittite in the Old Testament? Most famous? Uriah, thank you. Yeah, Uriah the Hittite, remember the husband of Bathsheba who comes to a bad end? And uh, so anyway, the Hittites are mentioned. And there was a Hittite empire up in what we would call Turkey, it's Anatolia. And Tutmos is able to push the boundaries of Egypt at this time all the way up to where it actually hits the border of the Hittites. And that became a great standoff for a long time. This contest between the Hittites wanting to move south and the Egyptians wanting to push north And the balance point, the point where the two empires sort of touched each other, was a city called Kadesh, K-A-D-E-S-H. 
and Kadesh is right there at the point where those two empires met. There's a famous battle in history called the Battle of Kadesh. It was fought by um, um, Hattushili, who was a Hittite, and Ramses II, who was an Egyptian, and it was fought in about 1276 in the very middle of the period that we would call the period of the Judges. And I want to look at that, not today, but we're going to look at the Hittites in two weeks. We're going to look at the rest of Egyptian history next week, then the Hittites the week after that. Then we're going to celebrate Christmas for three weeks. And then we're going to come back in January and start up looking at the Assyrians. So that's kind of the agenda, in case you think I'm wandering aimlessly in the desert here. Uh, I do have a plan, uh, and that's the plan right at the moment. So anyway, this is Tutmos III, very successful, very powerful, awesome ruler, one of the most respected and uh, famous military rulers, uh, of uh, military-oriented rulers of Egypt in all of her history. Well, of course, while he's reigning, uh, Moses is tending sheep in Midian and uh, probably is just trying to forget all of those experiences there. The successor to Tutmos takes the throne at the death of his father. He's a legitimate son. There's no question, no contest about succession at this point. His name is Amenhotep II. He reigns for about 30 years. If our chronology is correct, this would be the pharaoh of the Exodus. So it's a new young pharaoh. It's not Tutmos. It's this new son who comes on in about 1450. As I said earlier, the Exodus would be, by biblical reckoning, 1447 to 1445, sometime in that time frame. Amenhotep II was a very competent ruler. He left some artifacts. This is a little statue of him. It's actually a pretty good sized statue of him uh, in a kind of worship setting, offering gifts to uh, a god. And this is uh, found at the Egyptian Museum. Uh, he was young, he was athletic, he was ambitious. He had all of the DNA of his father. He had all of the intentions of simply solidifying and consolidating and extending the great achievements of his father, Tutmos III. He had big shoes to walk in, but I think he thought he was up to it. We have interesting little images of him. This is a pretty well-known granite stele in which Amenhotep II is shown. I don't know how well you can see it, but he's in a chariot to the left of the image there, and he's shooting arrows. This chariot is being pulled by a horse at a, at a rapid speed. So this is the picture is, here's Amenhotep II in a chariot that's racing down across the, well, you know, whatever the plain there, and he's shooting arrows at a target and hitting the bullseye with every one of them, you see. And the likelihood is that that was pretty accurate. That was the kind of guy he was. He was somebody that liked to be out there in the action. He was full of himself. He was young, he was arrogant, he was exactly the kind of person you would expect Moses to be dealing with in the account of the Exodus. And so we have this uh, Amenhotep II. The first few years of his reign, he's very active. He's out engaging in military campaigns fairly aggressively and with some degree of success. But around the year 1447, 1446, somewhere in there, this old guy, 80 years old, comes in to his courtroom and says, let my people go. And so it's going to be right at this point, around 1447, that we have then the events that are connected with the Exodus. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in terms of the plagues. I've talked about this before, and some of you were in the class that we did last year on the book of Exodus, in which we went in some painful detail into each of the plagues and kind of the ecologic of them and so on. So I'm going to bypass that and just let you know that that material's out there if you're interested in it. And for purposes of expediency, I'm just going to mention to you, there were 10 plagues. And it was not fun for the Egyptians. And they did represent a kind of calculated attack on, first of all, the Pharaoh as a sort of godlike character, and secondly, on the pantheon of gods in Egypt. And so when we look at the plagues, we can see that there is an interesting design to them in which in some ways the gods of Egypt are being made fun of or even worse, are beginning to be what appear to be gods who are, who are attacking the Egyptians. The Nile River becomes blood, you know, that kind of thing. The frogs that were worshipped are attacking 
the Egyptians. So the whole thing makes a kind of great parody of the Egyptian pantheon and so on. And you know the story, by the time we get to the end of the 10 plagues, Amenhotep has had enough. It probably took about a year for all of these plagues to be unleashed. If you read them carefully, the account, it seems that you keep an eye on the seasons as they're described and so on. It probably took about a year. And by the, by the time we get to the Passover night and the death of the firstborn, we have this Pharaoh, Amenhotep, who had been so arrogant, so convinced of his own power and so on, ready to cave in. Which way did the children of Israel escape? This has been a highly controversial question that remains largely unresolved. I don't think there's any majority view out there. I'm happy to say that to you because it's one of those rare occasions when I can say I'm in the minority, but I'm really sure I'm right. You know. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to give you my hypothesis. It's certainly not my invention. It's been around for a long time. It is the view taken by many people who take very seriously the biblical account. It has been, as you're probably aware, fashionable, especially in some more critical or liberal schools, to minimize, and in some cases even deny, but at least to minimize the Exodus. One of the interesting little points of ambiguity is the Hebrew term Yom Suf, which is translated Red Sea, can also be easily rendered Sea of Reeds. You're probably familiar with that, you've probably heard that. Now, that's interesting. We also know in the Old Testament that the Red Sea is referred to by that very name. So, you know, one way or another, it doesn't prove anything necessarily, but it does create an ambiguity. So some have suggested that the Exodus was really the children of Israel escaping across a fairly, fairly narrow body of water that was kind of, you know, with reeds and things sort of, and then the, the chariots of Pharaoh rolled in there, got stuck in the mud, and later historiographers of the Jewish people greatly embellish the story, and we have this extravagant, dramatic account of the Exodus and so on, but it really wasn't like that at all. People who take the biblical account more seriously, like your Sunday school teacher, don't find that a very satisfying explanation. But it still has been problematic trying to understand just exactly where it took place and how it took place. I'm going to give you a hypothesis. I'm certainly not going to say to you this is for sure the case. It's just simply a view that's been taken by some. But I wanted you to see this map because at least it gives some idea of, of the various uh, explanations that you'll run into. One of the things that has been somewhat confusing is the whole question, where is Mount Sinai? And if you look at this map, you'll see at the very bottom of it, at the base of the Sinai Peninsula is a place called Jebel Musa, literally Mount of Moses. And that has been traditionally viewed as the place where Moses got the Ten Commandments. And indeed today, if you were to call up a travel agent and say, I want to go to that Mount Sinai where Moses got the Ten Commandments, that's where they would send you. That has been the conventional uh, view of it. That view, however, can clearly be traced back to Christian monks of the second century. It's never been a Jewish view at all. There are Herculean arguments against that. At the time that the children of Israel left Egypt, there was a huge uh, Egyptian population there, for example, including a fairly significant military presence right there. There were mining operations. It's really kind of hard to imagine a million Israelites winding up there, spending a couple of years, and not having at least some significant problems with the huge Egyptian population that was there. It's also hard to imagine why this would be the mountain where Moses was tending sheep and saw the burning bush, because that's the same mountain, you see. He was in Midian, and that's a long way to take sheep, you know, down to this arid place in the middle at the bottom of Mount Sinai where he could find a burning bush. More probable is the view, and this has been widely, I think, accepted by many. Again, it's not my private view by any means, that Mount Sinai is really a mountain though it's called Mount Sinai, that's, it's also called Horeb, and it's in the region of, of Midian. So uh, that, would, that would change the whole story as well. Anyway, i just show you that map to give you some idea of the possible uh, routes, but I'm going to suggest to you one hypothesis here just for your interest. It would suggest to us that if, if, if you look at this map, the great body of water to the bottom is the Red Sea. 
And then the Red Sea has two arms, you see, and those two arms reach up and form the Sinai Peninsula. The left-hand arm is called the Suez, and the Suez Canal, as you know, is there. The right-hand arm is called the Gulf of Aqaba. And in terms of trying to find a plausible way in which you could refer to the Red Sea as at the same time a place where an exodus crossing could take place, it would obviously be this Gulf of Aqaba. And so that has been suggested and, in, and at least to some degree uh, examined by some. I don't think anyone agrees that this has been convincingly proven either way. But if that's the case, then the route that was taken by the children of Israel would look something like this. They crossed the Sinai Peninsula and they came probably to the top of the Gulf of Aqaba there expecting to go off into Midian. I don't know if you caught it, but in the first verses of this chapter, it says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and camp in front of pi Hahiroth between Migdal and the sea. Now that's an odd thing, isn't it? They're hot, escaping Egypt, and God says to Moses, Turn back. You think they just go forward, you know. Well, if they were there at the very topmost edge of the Gulf of Aqaba, expecting to go into Midian, that would be possibly the point where God said that to Moses, turn back. Well, turn back could mean one of three things. Turn back going to the north, but that's already been ruled out because it's the region of the Philistines. And we've already been told earlier in the text they're going to avoid that because they're going to avoid war with the Philistines. It could mean go straight back like a 180 but that would just send them right back to Egypt. That doesn't make sense. The third option would be to go south. That doesn't make a lot of sense because it runs them right down along the eastern side of the Gulf of Aqaba, and it puts them in a very interesting predicament, you see, in terms of escaping, but that seems to be what would have been suggested. If they did that, then they would have come down and probably wound up at a region that's called the Nueva Peninsula. Again, if you just take a look at this, that's about where that line winds up. It's a large, very large, kind of sandy, hard-packed, sandy beach. And it extends out into the Gulf of Aqaba. This is a satellite photo of it today, and it looked about the same in the ancient world. If you were to look at it out from, on top of the sea, kind of looking back, that's what it looks like. It's easily large enough to accommodate the number of people who would have been with Moses. They would have come down a fairly, fairly narrow wadi or ravine down these mountainous uh, you know, terrain into this wide open area where they could all be uh, you know, there. But obviously it puts them in a bit of a pickle because there's no escape. And now you've got the chariots of Pharaoh coming down this same ravine plugging up an escape route to the back. You can't go north or south because you get into, there's, there's no passable terrain there. You just are pushed out into the water. And to go forward, of course, you've got the water of the Gulf of Aqaba. And so it feels, from the point of view of the Israelites, that they have just become bait, sitting there on this Nueva Peninsula, and the chariots of Pharaoh are coming after them. In fact, um, uh, they are bait because Pharaoh is going to come and think he's going to capture them when in fact God has other designs in mind. Now with this in mind, I'd like to refer you back to the text that we were just uh, looking at. So we're at uh, Exodus chapter 14 and I'd like to just pick up at verse 10. This is my Sunday school lesson, okay? Every week we need a Sunday school lesson after we do all this history stuff. And I want you to get this lesson. I want you to imagine that you were there with the Israelites on that beach. And you can hear the thundering sound of the chariots coming down that ravine. And you look straight forward and you see nothing but water. And I have a lot of sympathy for these folks, to be honest with you, in terms of what's described. As Moses drew near, the Israelites looked back and there were the Egyptians advancing on them in great fear the Israelites cried out to the Lord. Nothing wrong with that. When you are in great fear, you should cry out to the Lord. That's lesson one. Then they said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? Of course, there's a lot of 
kind of sarcastic irony there because there was no nation in the world more famous for its graves than Egypt. They had mastabas, they had pyramids, they had all kinds of elaborate burial techniques. They were probably more famous for their graves than any other single thing, you know. And so the Israelites are asking Moses, what, the graves in Egypt weren't good enough? You know, we had to escape out here into this place. What have you done bringing us out of Egypt? Isn't this what we told you? I told you so, you know. Uh, Let us alone, we'd be better off to serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to die there, serving the Egyptians, than to die here in the wilderness. All right. Moses gives now to these people great counsel. I want you to just be aware, as I am, as we all are, that sometimes we are on that beach. And for whatever reasons, whatever circumstances in life have put us there, we can feel the Egyptians closing from behind, and it seems there is no escape. You ever been there? Some of you may be there right now. Financial circumstances, health circumstances, family problems, whatever, has put you on a beach, and it looks like no escape. Nothing we can do. It's over. I would have been better off, you know, back somewhere else. But I trusted God, I obeyed him, and look at what it got me. Here I am. You You ever felt that way? Moses gives three pieces of advice to God's people, and I believe this, these, this verse is worth memorizing and kind of reciting to yourself every day. Listen to what he says. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, stand firm, see the deliverance of the Lord. Do not be afraid. I heard someone say once, I don't know if it's true, I've never done the arithmetic. But I heard someone say once that the phrase, do not be afraid or fear not, occurs in the Bible exactly 365 times. That's a lot of times. It also happens to match up with the number of days in the year, you know. And so the point that was being made was you got one of these for every day of the year. Like I say, I've never added them up. So I don't know if that's true. I'm not teaching that. I'm just saying somebody said that once, I think, in a sermon, and it kind of stuck with me. Be aware of this. There's plenty of them in the Bible. And the first counsel that you need to take to heart when you're on that beach and you're feeling the pressure of the circumstance is do not be afraid. The great characteristic of God's people in the face of catastrophe is their equanimity, their trust their confidence in God. Second thing, stand firm. Not get busy, not go do a bunch of stuff, not gen up some new designs, new plans, new strategies. There's a time for that, there's a place for that, but there's also a time to simply say, God, I'm at the end of my rope here. I don't have any other strategies, I don't have any other plans, designs. All I can do is trust you. But that is a posture of standing firm, firm foundation. David often likes to talk about God as the rock upon which we can plant our feet and have this great confidence in him. And then finally, see the deliverance of the Lord. Watch what God will do. Don't fear, stand firm, and watch for what God will do. There's a time in our lives when we should be busy. There's a time when we should be doing things, when we should be active. There's a time when we just need to park, stop, take a deep breath, stand firm, and say, okay, God, what are you going to do? And watch what he does. And that, of course, was what happened with the Israelites. And who could have guessed? I don't even know that Moses had an idea what God would do. But it must have been astonishing beyond all description when they saw God just open a channel. People who've looked at this region of the uh, Gulf of Aqaba have noted there's a very odd anomaly right here. That sandbar that you see actually is the beginning of a kind of long sand bridge that goes all the way, a sort of land bridge, all the way across the Gulf of Aqaba. Most of that gulf is precipitously deep. You couldn't, you know, the children of Israel have to repel down the sides 
to get across. It would have been impossible even without the water there, except for right here. But those who've looked at it, and you've got topographical examination and so on, it was actually a fairly shallow uh, walk across from one end to the other, and you would have water on both sides. If the water were taken away, you could still have water on either side, and yet this kind of land bridge extends from one side to the other, and so they could cross. If the chariots of Pharaoh chased in after them, they might have just thought this was some kind of fluke of nature. We've seen a few lately, you know, and um, the water could have come right back and trapped them there. There's been all kinds of attempts to go out with scuba gear and find artifacts. I have no position on that. I think, you know, we got a lot of mixed reviews as to so that gets a little bit uh, too spooky for me. So I don't know if we have any, anything out there that actually represents hard, uh, cold evidence that there's been some kind of finding of chariot wheels and that kind of thing. That, that remains to be examined more thoroughly. But certainly, at least as a plausible hypothesis, uh, that could be the